Welcome to the All Things Physical Therapy Podcast. This is your host, DPT Steph, your doctor of physical therapy, bringing you all things PT with an interdisciplinary approach so that you can be the best clinician that you want to be. Thank you for tuning in to the All Things Physical Therapy Podcast. This is Stephanie, your doctor of physical therapy, otherwise known as DPT Steph. On this episode, we'll be talking with Dr. of Physical Therapy Taylor Eckel, who is a recent new grad with a passion for PT and EBP. To get us started, Taylor, why don't you give us a little introduction about yourself? Thanks, Steph. I'm excited to chat with you today. I, like you said, am a new grad PT. I graduated from George Fox University in May of this year, so a great time to launch my career in the middle of a pandemic. Um, But my history with PT stretches all the way back to 2008 when I was still in high school and I got my first job as an aide. And even before that, I had been a a patient. And so um, I've been hooked, I guess you could say. And the more time I spend in this field, the more I realize how much there is to learn. But also that makes me really excited to be a part of a field um, where I will always have to be updating and challenging myself. Um, I'm currently in between jobs, but outpatient Sports ortho is my jam, um, although I did have really positive experiences in other settings. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Did you always know that you wanted to be an outpatient from the get-go? I know you said you were an aide. Was that also an outpatient? Did you ever play sports? Do you have a sports background? Yeah, yeah. So I was an aide in a couple different outpatient ortho clinics and always kind of knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, I played soccer and basketball in high school and even now, I mean, apart from COVID, I'll play anything with a ball, preferably <laughs> if there's a team involved. Um, I once smashed my face playing spike ball in PT school, so that was real oh, fun. <laughs> <laughs> Love spike ball. But, Always a good time. Yeah. Yeah. So over the past, okay, so right now it's November. I can't do math. We'll say five, six months. I don't even know what, time, what day it is anymore. Over those few months since you graduated, I know you said right now you're in between jobs, um, but what have you found to be, now we're in a pandemic, so let's add another layer, what have you found to be the biggest difficulties as a new grad, whether it's things you feel like you still don't know or need to learn, whether that's, you know, figuring out your job situation or I don't know when you took boards, so if boards, uh, you know, hinder that as well, just kind of what everything, tie everything in, what's the past few months like been for you? Yeah, I think I rescheduled and scheduled my board exam probably five different times. I was originally scheduled to take it the end of April before my last clinical ended, and that didn't happen. So I ended up taking it in May, I think it was mid-May maybe, Um, and that was ended up being fine. I was able to take it close to home, fortunately. But yeah, the job market was really rough. Um, Just for perspective, I had interviewed somewhere in February that I was really excited about, and they were gonna give me a final answer on a Tuesday, and that was the day after kind of everything broke loose in Oregon. So that was became off the table really quickly. Um, but I had gotten good advice to start looking early. And so I had looked, I think I first interviewed for even a different company was in February. And so I had those kind of in my back pocket, those connections going off to my last clinical and then you know, lost all those opportunities because of COVID. I think the biggest issue that I see is that no amount of networking prepares you for the fact that the only available jobs might be jobs that either don't fit your career goals or don't fit your values. And I think that um, has been something that I have come up against a couple times here now. Yeah. So for you, what are some of the values that you might look for in a job or the jobs that you did see out there? What either hindered you from not applying or, you know, not keeping them on your radar? Yeah, there were a couple jobs that I thought would have been good fits. um, And they ultimately went in both cases with people who had more experience. And those were really constructive interactions with, you know, the people in those decision making positions who you give me a lot of positive feedback and said, you know, at the end of the day, it's less risky to hire somebody that's not a new grad. And we have to make that decision in this time. So I totally get that. Um, I think something that I really value is just ethical patient care and professional autonomy. So I don't ever want to be in a situation where someone else <clears throat> dictates what my treatment sessions look like, whether that is constraints on what units I have to bill 
or whether that is an expectation that I subscribe to a particular methodology. Um, I don't want that external pressure, but then also I've been in situations where there are some pretty sketchy billing practices. You know, I had talked to one company and they said, oh yeah, you know, we want you to save your hands. So if a patient needs manual therapy, we have Theraguns and the aides can do that. Uh, I thought, oh, Jesus. <laughs> um, those are two different things. <laughs> of, yeah. All right, good to know. Yeah, yeah. We're not going to talk with y'all anymore. And then even, uh, we can get into this more later, in the place where I ended up working, there were times when I saw things that made me kind of scratch my head or even in one instance where another person in the office came to me and said, oh, you need to um, essentially lie on this pre-authorization and make the patient look worse than they are so that you get more visits. Mm. Or then I would get pressure too. You're discharging people too soon. Uh, you need to see people for more visits. Well, it's not my fault that the patient's better. <laughs> the right, of course. Good about it. Yeah. yeah. And, it's you know, almost some like people a- Sorry, just one thing. I want to just touch on that because I think that's such a good point to have. It's like a double-edged sword because we know as PTs or even as students that one, it's a terrible debt to income ratio. Obviously, everyone's situational dependent when it comes to debt, but the ratio could be better as far as salary. Then you have insurance barriers that are constantly an issue where you're like fighting for visits because there are patients who still are not better. But then you also have, unfortunately, the other side of it where it's like coming from a practice standpoint where they need to make money because insurance also does not pay well. And then the final point to that is it's also your license. It's not the clinic's license. So in the end of the day, you're supposed to be the one dictating care. And I think what you just touched on is exactly kind of where I wanted this conversation to go because I know we see eye to eye on these kind of things. And it's just, these are the conversations that we need to have. It's like, how are we supposed to manage this? And I know no one wants to be out of a job, especially as a new grad. And, but you kind of need to really recognize these situations and say, nope, these are not great to work in. And maybe I'll be out of a job for a month or two and I'll have to pick up some weird in-between PT type job. But in the end, you don't want someone knocking on your door in 10 years and coming at you for fraud. Yeah, exactly. And even I think, you know, the conversation about new grad burnout is one that gets had often and, you know, it's a particularly salient in this environment, but I was only in that job maybe 12 weeks and it was miserable. Like some of the stuff I'd see, I'd go home and just think to myself, like, do I say something to the clinic director? Will he even hear it from me? Uh, I'm not okay with this. Or then when I would sometimes see patients who'd been treated by him, (laughs) you know um it's a little bit of a head scratcher or even to get lectured on notes and you know he would tell me you know you need to really let that doctorate shine in your in your notes I don't think he ever even looked at my (laughs) notes but whatever but then yeah would you read a note and you think like I know nothing about this human being all I know is patient responded well to treatment continue to progress plan of care well, that tells me nothing about anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and it just makes you question, like, what are we even doing here? Like, why? I don't even know why we're seeing this patient. I just read 10 notes for, of their 27 visits. Yeah. Know, for and their it's like lateral ankle sprain. <laughs> right. And another another good point to that, too, is if you're when you're debating on saying something, worst case scenario, they fire you or they let you go because they don't really want that opinion in their clinic. They want to just tell people how things should go in their eyes. But then, from the other standpoint, you have to realize you are easy, like easily replaceable, disposable, I think is a good word that a lot of people use. And especially, unfortunately, it's like that everywhere in most careers. But for some reason, a lot, of, I feel like PTs don't realize that yet. Yeah, like, if you don't take the sucky job, there's going to be someone else right behind you that's willing to take it. Um, so you really have to essentially know your worth. And again, it's your license. And I will say that until the day I retire or die, it is your license. And everyone I feel like should know that the second they graduate and have that drilled into their head to really understand like how you practice should be dictated by you because you're the one. I mean, the clinic might be chased after for fraud as well, but it's ultimately all on you. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because as you talk about that, it sounds a lot like dating, right? And I think that's what being a new grad is like in a lot of ways because you're always trying to put your best foot forward on job interviews. And to some extent, so are, you know, the company or the clinic that you're interviewing with. And then you get into it and you're like, whoa, this is not 
what I thought it was, but you know, that paycheck keeps you coming back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think that having that clear sense of professional autonomy and ownership over your own license is so key. And I think too, just being willing to call it quits when you realize it's not a good fit is Mm -hmm. I think really important for personal integrity as well. Um, And then hopefully asking better questions next time. And that really came up in that first job. They did not get me up to full time as quickly as they thought they would be able to, um, which after being there, again, is one of those things you think, how on earth did you say, oh, yeah, you'll be full time by August? There's no way you had the patient caseload (laughs) for that. Um, So I was covering in a different office and just casually chatting with that clinic director one day. And she made the comment to me that she really prided herself that their clinic um, average course of care was in the single digits. And I thought, man, I never thought to ask in my initial interview with kind of my home clinic of like, hey, you know, how many visits per patient do you average? Because some, one of the things that I was seeing that was so frustrating there was patients being seen for you know, 20 plus visits for something mm. very um, uncomplicated and garden variety. And so it was just really refreshing even talking to a different clinic director in the same company who maybe had the values that were more aligned with at least some of mine. Um, and that definitely was a helpful perspective to realize, man, there are things I can ask about in interviews that will be even more pointed than the things I already have said or, or asked. Yeah, that's a great point to make. And I wouldn't even have thought about that. And I think that's, that's a huge takeaway. Um, yeah, thank you for that. Because I, I appreciate that so much. Because it's just something I never even thought about, or I feel like haven't even heard anybody discuss. But especially with like the times right now, that's definitely a, a good point to make. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about Level Up because I know we're going to have Zach and Steph on the podcast. If you guys aren't familiar, it's the Level Up Initiative. They're coming on the podcast eventually, so you'll learn more through them. But I know Taylor uh, is involved as well. And now she went from, if you, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll retract a little bit. It's a mentorship program. It's free. You can do it as a student or a new grad. Um, so I went through the program uh, actually as a new grad, right after I graduated. And Taylor, I don't know when you did it, but I know you went through the program as well. And now she's a mentor. So I want her to touch on it a little bit about what her experience is um, and so forth. Yeah, I've been a part of Level Up since the very beginning. Um, Zach actually reached out to me while I was still in PT school to be um, in their beta test cohort. So there were a handful of us who kind of pre-tested their curriculum. And what it is, for those of you who don't know, is um, it's kind of the soft skill size that you don't always necessarily get in PT school of things like growth mindset, critical thinking, communication. They actually have two modules on communication in the four-month program. And I would say as someone who's gone through it as a student and then been a mentor as a student, now gearing up to be a mentor again for this January cohort, um, it's not such a big time commitment that is prohibitive to do while you're in PT school. I would really encourage both new grads and students to do it because it's honestly a breath of fresh air to get on a Zoom call with other people in your same, you know, life situation who are either right where you are, you know, plus minus a year or two, and they're all trying to be better as clinicians. They're all trying to be better humans in clinic. Um, And then you have a framework, you know, to work through together to grow and have those discussion points built in. Um, So I can't say enough good things about it. I think they do a really good job, too, of making it relevant across all settings, even though I think typically people that gravitate towards it are probably more ortho-minded. But I I was a mentor for it while I was in an acute care rotation. I felt like Mm -hmm. the content was still really applicable. Yeah, I mean, I went through it. So like I said, when I just became a new grad and I just started my acute care job. So whenever they asked in these discussions, for examples, all my examples came from acute care. And I will say it was a little tougher because I do feel like it, yes, it is a little more beneficial to an ortho type setting, but it still really makes you think. And I think growth mindset, one is a huge thing, but just thinking, thinking critically in one way, but also thinking as a patient of a whole patient in front of you and forgetting about textbooks and forgetting about diagnoses and forgetting about super specific prescriptions, essentially. So I think it's just a huge way to really take that big picture into practice. And that's going to be what essentially makes you a great clinician. So I think student to new grad, like even if you're out for a year or two, sharpen your skills a little bit, maybe 
become more aware of what you're doing in the clinic or in your practice already. Huge, huge, huge thing to do for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Highly recommend. Love it. All right. I also want so many things to talk about with you. Also want to talk about you just launched a special project and I think we should talk about it because you're using your, I guess, PT and non-PT knowledge to say. So I want to talk about how you either came up with the idea, started this idea, how like everything, all the details, give it to us. Yeah. So what Seth's referring to is the Integrity Training Project, which is my coaching business. But then um, the longer I've, I've been involved in kind of PT social media, if you will, for a couple of years, my account actually started, funny enough, as a wannabe Fitspo account back in maybe oh, 2014. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> um, yes, we all start somewhere. But <laughs> exactly. The more I was involved in PT social media, I saw this big gap between um, clinicians who have a background in strength and conditioning and those who don't. And I think even just talking to my classmates, a lot of PTs are very active people already, or some understand the benefits of physical activity and don't really know where to get started. So I wanted to have something to speak into that space of helping students and clinicians take ownership of their health, but then also giving a framework for them to grow in their knowledge of exercise prescription. Um, and then making it accessible both in terms of the cost, in terms of the time commitment, and also in terms of the delivery. So Integrity Training Project is there are a couple different tiers. It's an app-based fitness program um, that starts at like a three-time-a-week version, and there's also a four-time-a-week version, and there's also a, a total beginner version that doesn't require barbells. Um, that's also three times a week and then rolls into kind of a a transition to learning to use barbells and then into the main three time a week program. Very, very cool. And I like that you mentioned like tying in the strength and conditioning component because I know, so me personally, my PT journey has no ortho background, even though I was an athlete and I just feel like my strength and conditioning side of things is completely foregone because PT school does not touch on it nearly as much as it should when it's such an important thing. So I've bought books and I've tried to figure it out, but I didn't, I started actually through one of those Fitspo girls online. <laughs> I found like an online coaching program that I did my third year of PT school and someone who I knew like could solidly get me into the gym because they had something written out for me to do. So I didn't just like, you know, do three little bicep curls and like walk out. Um, no shade to people who do bicep curls, but like your girl did not have, again, no, no knowledge on that whatsoever. Um, but I think really getting myself in the gym and then feeling everything work no matter what the exercise was was a huge 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 component to then when I did like a ortho stint after I graduated for a few months like really helped me understand what my patients were going through and how to properly cue them or like have them work through the exercise as well so I think that's a super super great idea and someone who is a PT and then also combining that knowledge I think is a like a super unique and special component to have when you're looking for a program like that how about that um, but that each month then also has a video of me narrating through talking through why the exercises are the way they are that month, why the dosage is what it is, how it relates to the previous month, because I think sometimes um, it can be, it feels like as a new grad, maybe that people just try to have this huge knowledge bank of exercises, right? What mm -hmm. are all these, what are the best shoulder exercises? What are the best knee exercises? Yeah. Like, well, it's maybe not the right question to be asking. Is how because can I we have... expect everything to be black and white. And as we learned in school, it depends. But I know it's such a huge barrier for everyone to get over because we're, we're just expecting it to be so concrete. Well, and even in the way we approach studying, I think we often approach studying in a way that undermines critical thinking a little bit. You know, how many of us in anatomy sat there and memorized muscle actions? Yeah. Which I think is the stupidest waste of time. No offense <laughs> to anybody who did that. Our yep. professor <laughs> straight up told us, don't do that. He's like, get rid of this, you know, origin insertion BS. He's like, proximal and distal. It will make it so much easier to visualize if one end's fixed, what are the actions? What's the, if the joint angle changes, does the line of pull change? You know, really use your brain and don't just memorize and regurgitate. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I can take that same approach with exercise. For sure. That's a great point to make too. I wish someone told me that when I was 
taken anatomy. That would have been super, super helpful, but I digress. Um, where do you see, I know, so you like, you said you started your social media account as like a Fitzbo type thing. And obviously now it's evolved into the com probably complete opposite with a little bit of twist of Fitzbo. So you post things, um, if you guys don't follow Taylor, we'll give uh, her details at the end, but it's honestly a great account because it talks about your new grad stuff, the typical PT BS that we have to like push through and continue to push through, as well as some awesome weightlifting or sport or strength and conditioning type things, I would say. So where have you, where do you feel like your account is going at this point and how do you feel like social media can tie into the PT profession, whether it's regarding educating patients or future patients or even just like other PTs or students? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think I definitely struggle sometimes to figure out where I want to go with it because right now I'd say it's a pretty solid mix of clinicians and non-clinicians who follow me. Um, so for example, in my one-on-one -on -one coaching, the vast majority of people I work with are personal trainers. So that, that's a different, you know, set of interests than a new grad PT, say. So I think my content is trying to hit a really broad audience. And at the end of the day, I want it to be educational. I want it to be thought provoking. And I want that education to cut two ways, right? It's not just for the people consuming it, but hopefully by me thinking through posts, writing them up, and then even receiving critical feedback, we're all getting better is the goal. So I think just continuing to use it as an educational platform. Um, a place to maybe offer a different perspective on some of these things. And I really want people to come away from it thinking, oh, you know, that, that got me, that got the juices flowing in terms mm -hmm. of that thought process. Yeah. So what are your push going forward now? Where do you see it? I don't know, like social media in general for the PT profession, like where do you, where are you seeing it going or hoping for it to go? Yeah, that's, man, that's such a great question. And I think it's, who knows, right? <laughs> who, who knew that Instagram would get this big? Um, I think it's really interesting because I see such a bifurcation in the way both patients and PTs consume it. Um, and I think some people are out there using it as a quick fix, right? You know, look at this party trick of a technique that changes shoulder internal rotation after blowing into a balloon. Shoulders. <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. Fix yo stuff. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation that tends to gain traction quickly because it's perceived as sexy. There's a lot of really great educational info out there. And then there's this weird middle ground of a lot of information that's sort of true and equally problematic. And who's going to win? Honestly, probably the clickbaity stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think for people who are wanting to show up in a really authentic sort of way, you can find other people on the gram that are doing that. Um, and I think being on social media is really helpful too, especially if you're working in an outpatient context, because you don't know what sort of, it, so your patients are taking in on their social media. And a lot of people do turn, you know, to these celebrity accounts or fit those that think they're PTs or PTs mm -hmm. that think they're FITSBOs, you know. And so I think it's helpful for PTs to know what their patients are taking in, know what other PTs are putting out there and decide is that something I'm about or not, um, and then ultimately find some community. Yeah, I think that's a great point too. You're saying like you should know kind of what your patients are taking in. And yeah, especially if you're in that outpatient type clinic where, you know, think of how many hours you spend on your phone now, a lot of people are also working from home. So especially in this time, people are probably consuming more so than they ever have before. So you need to kind of double down and really see what's out there. And unfortunately, yes, there is a lot of misinformation. So we need to be able to change the narrative if we have a patient that comes to us with this misinformation and kind of be able to fix or put a Band-Aid over the situation. So I think that's a great, great point to make because I've, I've never really thought of it like that, but I think that's a definitely a great outlook for sure. Um, to kind of tie into social media moving forward, where do you see, I know there was a big thing in the year 2000, there was like the vision 2020 by the APTA 20 years later, but where do you see as an individual or hope to see the PT profession moving forward, whether it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? 
Yeah, I think the big thing that I hope for the profession is that we can get a little bit more clarity regarding our identity. I think right now it's such a crapshoot. And you see that reflected even in some campaigns like the Get PT First campaign, which I am not a huge fan of. <laughs> I've spoken about that elsewhere. Um, but I think it was Laura Ospital made a great point that the, the first problem with that statement is that it says get PT, not see a PT. Um, and this mm -hmm. idea that PT is something that is done to people um, rather than a profession that can be consulted and rather than a skill set and a knowledge base that offers value that we're seeing more so in what we do to people. I would love to see that change and see better clarity um, at the you know, APTA level, national level, but then also even just in local marketing efforts. Um, you don't get endocrinology, you see an endocrinologist, right? You mm, don't get yeah. dentistry, you go to a dentist to see, yep, yep. you know, to work with them. Um, and maybe you need their services and maybe you don't, but maybe you still needed to go either way to find out. Uh, I think seeing that shift would be awesome in our profession. For sure. And I love how you, the, the words there, because I never, again, so many things we're learning today from Taylor. Um, this is why I had her on because so many ways that like I didn't critically think as well as she did. And I think these are, you know, you mentioned the other person um, that kind of brought it to your attention as well. I think there's so many different ways we need to start looking at things because it's that's totally true. And I even started saying things to patients in acute care when they say, oh, I tried PT and it didn't work. I have now changed my narrative to it and said, well, unfortunately you have to shop around sometimes for a good hairstylist or a good dentist, or there's not a doctor that you always vibe with. So you might have to try a different PT. And I will literally, literally tell them exactly that. Like not every PT is the same, just like not every doctor, how they treat is the same or how they talk to you or whatever the situation may be. And I think that's like a very good narrative to start, you know, letting people know not every PT, not every chiropractor or pr professional in general is going to work the same exact way or vibe the same way that you do. So you need to kind of shop around for it. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, it's time consuming, especially because PT is unfortunately not a quick fix as people want and they have to put in the time and effort for it. But I think just letting people know that there is there are multiple options out there and that's it's okay to take time and shop around and see what the best fit really is. Yeah, totally. And I would add that if that's something that people are interested in, learning more about that kind of existing conversation. Eric Mara's blog, The Science PT, is a great place to start. He wrote a piece during the pandemic called A Brave New Profession. That's a really good starting point. And then he has some older stuff as well um, talking about that exact issue. Perfect. Love it. Um, so a fun question that I'm going to be asking people because this is the time that we're in. What have you been doing during the pandemic or during quarantine? I mean, I know you worked, you had a, your new grad, so you're working, but aside from working, what fun things are you doing or what fun things should people try out in this time when they might have more time to do? So, I did go through a bread baking phase initially, but it didn't last very long, um, <laughs> but I just had to, I had to try it. <laughs> and it made some good homemade avocado toast, but I live in Oregon, so I'm really fortunate to be in close proximity to some really cool hiking. Um, so I've been getting out a ton, whether it's for day hikes or even some little overnights. And then now that it's winter, we have snow up on the mountains here, so it's snowboarding season. Um, so I would just say, yeah, getting outside. And if you're not somebody that gets outside a lot, the best way to start is to start. Uh, you don't have to have any fancy gear to take a nice little walk. I love it. That's great advice. And I totally hear you. I am not a fan of the snow, so I'm not jealous of that part, but I am jealous of having the hiking nearby. But my little strolls around the around the park nearby or the concrete jungle nearby is not the same, but we're, we're working on it. it. It does the same. Just getting the sun and the air in your face definitely makes a huge, huge difference. Um, I love it. Awesome. So Taylor, where can people find you on whether it's social media or the internet? Um, you have Instagram, Twitter, a website, give us the names for them right now. Yeah, so on Instagram, I'm at taylorecle.dpt. Um, and then on Twitter, it's taylor underscore echel. And then my website is integ integritytrainingproject.com. Perfect, love it. And again, Taylor Echel, it's T A Y L O R E C K E L dot dpt on Instagram. And then spelled the same way with an underscore for Twitter. And you guys heard her website. 
Um, any last thoughts you have for us, Taylor, before we wrap up? Nope. Just keep <laughs> stay in the course. We're all in this together, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, awesome. Thank you so much for joining. And I wish you the best of luck in your continued job search. And again, if you guys want to follow some awesome PTs on social media, definitely hit up Taylor and you can DM her, I'm sure, with any questions that you may have. She's nodding her head yes, so that's a yes. Definitely shoot her a message if you have any questions or want to uh, talk about anything from the podcast. But thank you so much for joining us. Um, that's all we have for you guys today. And you can follow the All Things Physical Therapy podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and maybe some more things in the future. We'll see. Stay tuned. Thank you, Taylor, for jumping on, and we'll talk soon. Thanks. Bye, Steph. Thank you for listening to this episode of the All Things Physical Therapy podcast. Make sure to leave a review and subscribe to stay updated on new episodes. You can find more episodes like these on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And to stay up to date, follow dpt.steph on Instagram or go to www.dptsteph.com.